At the 2013 Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics Conference on Computational Science and Engineering, the importance of building meaningful models to understand big data in order to predict events and make smart decisions was illustrated at panel discussions and lectures. Tamara Kolda of Sandia National Laboratories discussed the applications of modeling and measuring large-scale networks. Well, we're particularly interested in understanding the security of the Internet and connections that are happening there. We're also interested in modeling social networks and understanding the connections that form between people and why. There's a lot of social theories, and so we're seeing if we can validate them with what we see in real data. According to Kolda, one of the areas of interest is how social cohesion between members can impact the size of social networks. There's been lots of hypotheses that if two people are friends with a common person, they're more likely to be friends. One of the theories is that we only have so much energy to de devote to our friends, but there's less energy if you're friends. You can have more friends if they're more connected with each other. So it's one thing we're, we're interested in. We're also always interested in issues like peer pressure for teenagers, where these phenomena are very true. So if I have two friends and they are not friends with each other, there's a very good chance, at least in small studies they've done, that one of the, my, I won't be friends with the other one of those two people much longer, because I'll be forced to choose between them. While math models and data can be used to help validate the hypotheses from studies of social networks and other systems, the scale of these big data sets and the processing power needed to work with them creates challenges for researchers. Most really big data is proprietary in some fashion or other. So Facebook won't give me their access to their networks. Even if they were to give me access, it's big data, so I have to get it physically to my location in some way. And then the data is always being added to. So if you were to look at all financial transaction data, for example, there's many, many financial transactions every single day. So if you were to get sort of a live feed of that, that'd actually be a humongous amount of data, which would be hard to keep up with. Massive data is often problematic. It's too large to run on our laptops. So we look at high-performance computers where we can ingest those streams of data and then on the fly make decisions. In the session titled Big Data Meets Big Models, panelists discussed how the greatest advances from big data will be dependent on the integration of big data and mathematical modeling. From the modeling perspective, the availability of high quality data is absolutely crucial because it lets you inform the model and, and infer the parameters and try to put bounds on the uncertainties of that process. Panelists presented several examples of how big data is being applied in conjunction with modeling, such as epidemics and natural disasters. We're looking at massive data streams. For instance, we may look at public tweets and from those get a sense of the health of the nation. We take those tweets, we run them into supercomputers, and then we try to find breaking events such as severe storms or groups of people who may fall ill with, with the flu. Big data can often only be collected on related variables rather than the quantities we need. Hence, improved mathematical models are important in order to fill the gaps and make sense of the massive amounts of data collected. This is especially true in environmental modeling is only big in a certain sense. It's big in the sense that the volumes are large, but we're not really gaining, at least on the environmental field, massive amounts of data on the quantities that we're directly interested in. What we're gaining increasingly are massive amounts of data on related variables, which makes the modeling between these data sets and the ultimate parameters we're interested in really, really critical. What we really, really want is to be able to predict how the system will evolve in the future. We, of course, can't measure that. And so the next step back from that is to understand the processes that are driving the variability that occurs today, but we can't always measure that directly either. And so we really have to rely on these surrogate data sets to understand things at larger spatial and temporal scales. And once we do that, then that involves these complex models that allow us to link what we can actually measure with the processes that we're ultimately interested in. And so all these things really work together in concert, but always towards these, this ultimate goal of better predictive ability. All too often we talk about these things as if they were dichotomous ways of learning about the world. You know, the, the wired editorial, oh, we don't need models anymore, we have data. Well, you know, how are we going to predict climate in the year 2100 if we don't have models? We're not going to do that with data. How are we going to go to the Mars using data alone? How are we going to predict the onset of hurricanes? How are we going to predict the damage due to earthquakes from data. We don't need, we need the models, but to do the models, you need the data. 